Welcome, friends and colleagues. Um, welcome to our celebration today, um, to our event. Um, I'm Edward Schatz. I'm the director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies with a little bit of a head cold, so you'll excuse me. Um, today's event, as you know, is sponsored by the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, by the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, by the Canada Research Chair in Global Migration, the Department of Political Science, and the RF Harney Program in Ethnic Immigration and Pluralism Studies. And it's a really wonderful thing when we can bring together a whole bunch of different units um, uh, across uh, at least a significant part of the university to discuss um, an important topic, important series of topics as you'll, as you'll hear, and simultaneously to celebrate the work of a dear colleague and terrific scholar. And today is indeed a chance to celebrate um, we are celebrating a major contribution to our understanding of the links between migration, labor, and class. We are celebrating our dear friend, as I've mentioned, and a brilliant scholar, Randall Hansen. And others will have more to say about the book itself. But to my mind, Randall's research has always been deeply and exceptionally grounded in the sometimes messy particulars of the history, while at the same time always engaging big questions. Uh, the hallmark of his work, and, and this book exemplifies this point perfectly, is that it's always analytically trenchant and indeed intellectually fearless. And in spite of our turbulent times, or maybe precisely because of our turbulent times, uh, celebrate we must. Um, we aren't celebrating, of course, the topics that Randall addresses in this book with such a plum. The, the topics are actually quite difficult ones. Um, and, 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 the, and the stories, uh, in some cases, harrowing. Rather, we are celebrating how Randall treats them, that is to say, with intellectual nimbleness, with scholarly seriousness, with exceptional humanity, and with a real talent for writing. Uh, I encourage you to pick up a copy of the book for sure. Welcome once again, and let me now turn over the podium to the chair of the Political Science Department, Ryan Ballot. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, well, I am no more than a trespasser in these parts of campus, but I am delighted to join you today to say a few words about my friend and colleague, Randall Hansen. Randall, of course, needs no introduction at this university, but occasionally it is helpful to remind ourselves of the star power of our colleagues. As you know, Randall is professor and Canada Research Chair uh, in the Department of Political Science and the Monk School. He's played an outsized role as an academic and intellectual leader at this university and beyond. He did an effective stint as leader of series for five years and continues to direct the Global Migration Lab at the Monk School. Um, <clears throat> and he's widely considered to be a global top five scholar of immigration. And whenever people tell me that, I always say, give him time. He's still young. He will, he will get there eventually. Um, Randall Hansen works on three fields, migration, war, and civilian populations, and eugenics. One hallmark of his research is the effort to explain outcomes that cut against scholarly and even popular expectations. And I'll just give you a couple of examples from over his entire career. For example, why did the British government maintain an open door policy for hundreds of millions of Commonwealth migrants when neither they nor the British public wanted non-white immigration? That's the key question of his seminal book, Citizenship and Immigration in Post-War Britain, published in 2000. Um, why did eugenic sterilization not only continue, despite revelations, um, <clears throat> but also even increase after World War II? That's from Sterilized by the State. And today, we have the pleasure of hearing his reflections on his new book, War, Work, and Want, 
which explores the thorny question of why did global migration, despite attempts at limitation, vastly expand? In all these endeavors, Randall asks a difficult question and convinces colleagues with a counterintuitive explanation. Even if the question may sound straightforward in retrospect, that is only because Randall has isolated these questions and made them vivid. He knew that there were questions there when others didn't see them. It's partly for that reason, in fact, that his list of research awards is so long. It should be even longer. And in any event, I'm happy to boast on his behalf um, <clears throat> that he was awarded one of the very scarce inaugural Dean's Research Excellence Awards, along with numerous Shirk grants and other um, distinctions. <clears throat> Colleagues know that Randall is original and penetrating. He commands great intellectual respect across the university. If you know him as I do, you will have heard him say things like he's a recovering Catholic. You'll know that he's something of a contrarian, as well as a sharp wit. Beyond his humor, though, he has dedicated himself in a distinguished way to the life of the mind, in a way that I consider admirable and am happy to hold up as a paradigm to students and younger colleagues. And so today we look forward to discussing war, work, and want. Randall. Well, thank you. I'm um, slightly overwhelmed by these incredibly warm and generous uh, comments. Before I begin, I have a lot of people uh, to thank but let me mention a few, and I'm going to miss some people's so apologies in advance. Thanks to Ryan. Thanks to Ed Schatz and Peter Lowen for sponsoring uh, this event, to Phil Triadophilopoulos for sponsoring as well. To those in the room who were at my manuscript workshop and have read and commented on the book, Mark Manga, Lama Murad, Darius Ornston, Lou Pauli, Alexander Heisenbichler, uh, Paul Kingston, Ed Schatz again, Phil again, and Zach Rieker. And Another word of thanks to my outstanding RAs, Dahlia Bakaria has suffered this uh, book for years. Uh, she told me she's leaving Toronto as soon as she can, and I'm quite convinced it's to get out of her contract. Um, also, uh, Arjun Chowdhury and Aidan Kerr. Uh, thanks goes to my OUP editor, David McBride, as well as to Edith Klein and Mary Lou Roy. And let me give a warm welcome and a a particular word of thanks to my students in the room. Uh, however much I may or may not uh, teach you, I learn so much more from you. Now, I would like to begin with a story about a Syrian boy named Shukri. His family was one of two million refugees who fled bombs, gas attacks, and street fighting in Syria. In January 2016, he was 12 years old, and working in a basement in suburban Istanbul. Scissors clenched between his teeth. He ran bundles of fabric between the shop's 15 sewing machines and packed white sweaters. He worked 60 hours a week for 600 lira, 200 US dollars, 40% below Turkey's minimum wage. He said to a journalist, there's no time for school here. I can't go because of work, but I will when I return to Syria. He would do neither. The sweaters that Shukri boxed up were made for the Italian fast fashion firm uh, Piazza Italia, which has shops and online outlets across Europe. In late 2022, sweaters cost as little as five euro on sale. And Shukri, Shukri was one of thousands of Syrian refugees working in Turkish firms. The clothes they produce are sold in Europe by Next, Marks and, Marks and Spencers, H&M, Ralph Lauren, and Esprit. Their prices are at least 60% cheaper in real terms than they were in the 1970s. In that decade, factories in Northern Europe and towns such as Prato produced the garments. The workers were Italian, the wages were decent if not great, and the sector employed many more people than it did in France, Germany, or the UK. 
but across Western Europe, the textile and garment sector had expanded rapidly. Then, it all began to unwind. Since the 1980s, the Italian apparel sector has lost 236,000 jobs, more than half those in the industry. 180,000 remain, but Italians have exited the sector and mostly undocumented migrants have taken their place. The pay is low, the conditions are arduous, and the market is shot through with human trafficking. All of these developments, mass refugee flows, child labor, and migrants toiling in appalling conditions to produce cheap clothes for middle-class European consumers, they're connected. More than that, they all result from the same event. It happened in 1973. Now, having narrowed the view to one story, let me broaden it to 281 million. For that is total global migration. It is at a historic high, and it has tripled since 1970. This has happened, but it should not have. By 1970, and above all 1973, there was every reason to believe that global migration was over, that it was history, not politics. One country after another in Europe ended the guest worker and colonial migration schemes. The US placed a hemispheric cap for the first time in its history on Mexican migrants. In the US, Asian, South European, and Jewish immigration had been sharply limited since the 1920s, and no one thought the 1965 Act would lead to an increase. The global economy went into free fall. Less economic growth, less demand for labor. And finally, in the West, in the global North, the public opposed and still opposes immigration. In no country except this one does a majority of citizens support more migration. And they have intellectual support. Since uh, Jean Raspail's 1973 Camp of Saints, there has been a steady stream of right-wing drivel telling anti-immigration North Americans and, above all, Europeans what they want to hear. Immigration should have stagnated or declined, and yet it has increased year on year. That's the backdrop. The book asks one simple question. Why? And the answer lies in the OPEC oil crisis the conditions for which were created by the 1967 Six-Day War. On October 17th, 1973, almost exactly 50 years ago, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries instituted an oil embargo on deliveries, uh, sorry, <coughs> announced a historical price reevaluation, that was OPEC, and at the same time, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, OAPEC, instituted an oil embargo on oil deliveries to the US, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, and the UK because of their support for Israel in the Yom Kippur War. The oil embargo was temporary. The price revaluation, uh, re the quadrupling of oil prices within one year, lasted a decade. And it changed the global economy forever, and it changed geopolitics forever. It halved economic growth, and wages have stagnated since. The West built, rebuilt, and Asia built its standard of living on the back of cheap migrant labor. OPEC destroyed Nasserism and flooded the Middle East, the Gulf, the Gulf uh, states with oil money, sucking massive numbers of migrants to Saudi Arabia and other countries. It destroyed import substitution industrialization in Egypt and Syria, prompting in those countries an American-led turn to neoliberalism and, in Egypt, a short-lived Faustian pact with political Islam. It led to the Iranian Revolution, which led to the Iran-Iraq War. It brought America into the Gulf for two wars, and it encouraged the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan, creating the conditions for the Taliban, 9-11, and a 20-year American war in Afghanistan. Rather enough, don't you think? 
Now, first point, rebuilding standards of living on the back of cheap migrant labor. In the global north, in the west, we responded to this tripling of energy prices by turning on the workers. Politicians, academics, and journalists defined inflation as a wage problem. It was not a rather obvious reaction to this sudden oil shock. Rather, it was the union's outrageous demands that were destroying the entire American economic and indeed political system. The workers, as one labor historian put it, had to take their medicine. And they would, brutally, and to a degree that no one would have predicted at the time. One of President Ronald Reagan's first and defining acts was the sacking of over 11,000 air traffic controllers, public sector workers who had gone on strike uh, and ignored a return to work order. He completely broke their union, PATCO. He banned them from future employment. Their leaders were handcuffed and jailed. After PATCO, union labor fell back on all fronts and unionization rates in the U.S. plunged from a post-war high of 35% in 1955 to 6.2% and falling in the private sector. Now, that is neoliberal America. What about the cuddly socialists in Europe? Well, there, with the exception of the UK, the assault on the unions was far less direct, but they fell nonetheless. Unionization rates fell nonetheless, and an EU posting directive allowed firms to go around the unions entirely and hire cheap, expendable European migrant labor in the hundreds of thousands, 800,000 in construction alone. At the same time, EU firms outsourced and automated, as did their American counterparts, and they drove down wages in those sectors, textiles, agriculture, meatpacking, that could not be outsourced. The result was a collapse in working class wages, most extremely in the US, but also in the EU. Now, such developments are not without their advantages. Lower wages create direct benefits for those workers who maintain uh, or even increase their earnings, skilled ones. And that's because lower wages mean cheaper products for all of us. In 2017, a, La a Los Angeles garment factory worker uh, earned $3.42 per hour in LA, making clothes for TJ Maxx. The dress that this worker made sold for $24.90. Had she, it was a woman, had she been paid the federal minimum wage of $7.25, that dress would have cost $30.43. $30 had she been paid the Los Angeles minimum wage of $12, it would have cost $38.77. So the difference in price between that shirt made legally and with undocumented, badly paid labor is $25 to $39. Now that's the low end of the labor market. At the high end, or the consumer market, at the high end, an iPhone, if it were made in Seattle rather than China, would cost $1,300 rather than $1,000. So at the low and the high ends of the consumer market, low wages increase consumer affluence. And such examples are found throughout the Consumer Price Index. In the book, <coughs> what, a, what I and an RA did was estimate what a wide variety of goods should cost had they followed sectoral inflation upwards since 1979, the third column. And we compared that to what they actually cost, the fourth column. The results are striking. The price of clothing, sporting goods, and furniture in real terms has plummeted. Men's sweaters are 60% cheaper than they were in 1979. Men's jeans and a women's dress cost just over a third of what they did in 1979. And basketball and bikes cost a quarter. And this, in turn, explains a paradox that partly encouraged me to write this book. We have heard incessantly that middle class wages have stagnated since the 1970s. This is true. But middle class standards of living, defined in consumer terms, are much higher than they were in the 1980s. Regrettably, I speak from experience. 
They are so because of massive technological changes. Some of you will remember the phone book. But also because working class wages have collapsed. What this chart shows is that if you're educated, your wages are what they were in the late 1970s. If you have less than a high school education, your earnings have fallen from $40,000 US to $24,500, a huge drop, working class men. Unremarkably, uh, working conditions followed wages downward, long hours for arduous labor, few if any benefits, and no security of tenure. They reached a level at which most native-born workers, Americans and Europeans, were no longer willing to tolerate. And so domestic workers exited these wage-depressed sectors for better positions by skilling up or for long-term reliance on welfare and all too often alcohol and substance abuse, the deaths of despairs. Companies then turned to low-skilled migrants, documented and undocumented, to fill the gap. The need for a reservoir of cheap, disposable labor, including much migrant labor, accounts for the over-representation of migrants in six sectors, meatpacking, agriculture, construction, retail, textiles, and domestic labor. In every sector except the domestic, companies decimated, at times with the state's help, or circumvented the unions that stood in the way of their low wage strategy. Now that's the global north. In the west, the dynamic played out differently, but the end was the same. Wealth came later, and there was no moment of peak unionization. Rather, Malaysia, Korea, and above all, Thailand built dynamic, dynamic export sectors on the back of cheap labor, first rural to urban, and when that ran out, cheap migrant labor from uh, neighboring Asian countries. So in the case of um, Thailand here, from Laos, uh, from Burma, and from Cambodia. In uh, Asia, agriculture and fishing, construction, low-end manufacturing, and domestic care are as they are in the global north, wholly dependent on cheap migrant labor. In West Asia, in the Middle East, the post-OPEC demand for labor was greater still. This massive rush of oil money, as locals had no desire to work in the oil fields and women were excluded from so doing, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and the UAE had nowhere else to turn. Millions of low-skilled workers, first Arab, later South Asian, came to work in the Gulf states. In Saudi Arabia, the result was millions of migrants who left the rural, textured, and Sufi-infected Islam and received a midlife education in Wahhabi extremism. When oil prices collapsed in the 1980s, they entered, they returned to Egypt and entered the Egyptian labor market just as a mass of Egyptian university graduates the product of one of Nasser's great accomplishments, the opening of higher education, flooded it. Both groups, returning labor migrants and recent university uh, graduates, wanted work, but nothing waited for them but unemployment and corruption. And the result was disastrous. Neoliberal economics, embraced by Sadat in the 1970s, drove some of them, a small minority of them, into the arms of Egyptian political Islamists trained in Saudi Arabia and in Egypt, released by Sadat from Nasser's prisons. The Islamic group, the only Islamist based in Upper, that is Southern Egypt, provided services to the poor, recruited returning labor migrants from Saudi Arabia, recruited disaffected university, of gradu university graduates, and launched armed attacks on cops, tourists, and state officials. The Islamic group was responsible for the 1992 assassination of secular Egyptian professor Farag Foda, the 1996 shooting outside Cairo's Europa Hotel that left 18 dead, and the 1997 slaughter of 67, 62 people, most of them tourists, at Queen Hatshepsut's temple in Luxor. So to sum up the argument so far, in all of these cases, 
America, Europe, uh, Asia, and the Middle East, migrants suffer to varying degrees, low pay and arduous conditions. They appeal because they are cheap, because they do jobs that locals will not, and because they are disposable, bearing the brunt of unemployment in times of economic downturn. They are a global reserve of disposable labor. So who is to blame for this situation? Well, in their rapacious search for profits, multinational firms, some of us remember Greco, are undoubtedly a villain in the piece. In multiple sectors, corporations launched a war on the unions, they drove down wages, and they eliminated benefits. But they did not pursue this strategy for the pure joy of the kill. Instead, they did so to avoid going out of business. Had not, their buyers would have gone elsewhere. And who are the buyers? Well, we are. In all of these sectors, firms are responding to their pavemasters, to us. Competition drives down prices and therefore wages, but consumer preference drives competition. In the end, it is the consumer de consumer's de desire for ever cheaper holidays, food, clothing, electronics, cleaners, and caregivers, the desire to pay less and less, and ideally nothing, for more and more that pushes companies to meet our demand. So that is the story of the great upsurge in labor migration to the West Asia and the Gulf states since 1973. And I would add to that, it solves another little riddle. Why has the stagnation of wages since the 1970s not led, until the recent wave of populism, to a political revolution in the West? It's because the middle class was able to rebuild its standard of living on the back of cheap labor. Now, OPEC had further economic and political consequences. For the broader Middle East, for Central Asia, and for Russia. As Iran became richer than ever before, the Shah used his uh, wealth, his oil money, to fund his military and his white revolution. A massive modernization and secular pro, uh, secularization program in Iran, funding universities, hospitals, and infrastructure. Iranian standard of livings absolutely improved in the 1960s and 1970s after OPEC. But the oil money unleashed forces that the Shah struggled to control. The result was mass protests, a crackdown, the Machiavellian genius of the Ayatollah Khomeini, and the Iranian Revolution. The Iranian Revolution was a precondition, a precondition, not the sole cause, for the Iran-Iraq War. That war bankrupted Iraq and led, against a backdrop of low oil prices and insufficient oil revenue, to the 1990 invasion of Kuwait. America's post-1970s dependence on Gulf state oil, American re America reached peak oil in 1971, led the Americans to launch two attacks on Iraq. And collectively, uh, those three conflicts, Iran-Iraq and the two Gulf Wars, resulted in seven million, over seven million refugees. The Iranian Revolution also had profound consequences for another oil-rich state, Russia. The, Russia, the uh, Iranian Revolution led to the second oil shock of the 1970s. Prices shot up again. This sudden surge in oil prices engendered in the Politburo petromania, a delusional belief that politics poses no limits and that all things are possible. Petromania combined with fears in Moscow that the fall of its tottering client regime in Kabul would end the Soviet theft of Afghan gas, informed, did not cause, informed the 1979 Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Now, in invading Afghanistan, Moscow thought it would achieve a quick victory and install a pliant regime guaranteeing its access to stolen Afghan natural resources. But declaring jihad, Afghan resistors in the countryside fought back 
with a tenacity and a brutality that shocked Moscow, leaving jihad aside. Doesn't that sound familiar? The Red Army responded by drenching the Afghan countryside in bullets, bombs, and all manners of mines, mines designed, among other purposes, to blow the limbs off children. The goal, what was called migratory genocide, was to drive Afghans into the cities, which Moscow controlled, or out of the country. It did both, and millions fled to Iran and, above all, Pakistan. Rotting in refugee camps in northern Pakistan, young Afghan men who lost everything, who knew nothing but war, who were schooled in anti-Shiite and anti-Western hate and misogyny by barely literate Afghan mullahs, they became the Taliban. And in 2001, they harbored Osama bin Laden, himself a product of those very refugee camps, who launched the 9-11 attacks against the US. Those uh, attacks, of course, brought an American invasion of Afghanistan and the excuse to attack Iraq again. And the second Gulf War alone generated two million refugees. Now, the final connection I wish to make is between the oil crisis and the Arab Spring. All lines in my story are crooked. This one is particularly so. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the oil crisis played a role. Whereas the sudden surge in oil prices was a boon for the Gulf states, it was the opposite for states with little or no oil, Egypt and Syria. For oil-induced inflation put the last nail in the coffin of import, substitution, industrialization, getting rich behind a tariff wall. When growth collapsed and inflation surged, both countries, Egypt in the 1970s, Syria a decade later, turned, under American pressure, to liberal capitalism or neoliberalism. Privatization, reduced subsidies, tariff-free trade, inward American investment. As ever with capitalism, lots of wealth was created, flashy displays of which could be seen on the streets of Damascus. But it also generated massive inequality. This simmering discontent eventually burst out into the streets during the Arab Spring. Now, we think of the Arab Spring, particularly on this side of the world, as a movement for democracy and freedom. It was, but it was also, and more fundamentally, a call for economic justice. When Mohammed Bouazizi set himself on fire in December 2010, launching the Arab Spring, his cry was for economic, not political freedom. His last words were these, how do you expect me to earn a living? And he was not alone. Arab Barometer, a research network coordinated by Michigan and Princeton, conducted public opinion surveys from 2012 to 2014. They found that economics, corruption, itself partly a matter of economics, and social injustice were the main drivers of the Arab Spring. Corruption and the betterment of the economic system were tied at 65%, a reason for launching the Arab Spring, for taking to the streets. Social and economic justice was cited by 57%, democracy, civil and political freedom by only a minority, 42%. These feelings were particularly acute in Egypt, in Syria, and the result in the latter of the civil war that followed the Arab Spring was almost seven million refugees. So the oil crisis set and drained processes in Iran, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria and Libya, I've not talked about it, but I'm glad to, processes that generated over 20 million refugees. All right, I'm almost done. To sum up, global migration against both scholarly expectations and Western public wishes tripled since the 1970s because of the way in which the OPEC oil crisis reconfigured the global economy and geopolitics. War and work generated over 100 million migrants. But so did want, our desire.
forever cheaper products and services. And there's little evidence that will, anything will change. The dependence of multiple sectors of middle class affluence and of economies as diverse as those of Germany, Thailand, the US, and Korea on low skilled, cheap migrant labor suggests that it will continue. Mass migration is not, as Sir Paul Collier claims, a temporary response to an ugly phase in which prosperity has not yet globalized, a particularly Pollyannish view, I might add. Rather, large scale, low skilled, badly trained, badly paid, and ill-treated migrants are a structural feature of global capitalism. They are essential to life, to where and how we live, and to what we eat and where. Thus, war led tens of millions to flee, while work and want made them into disposable laborers. Work, our demand for it, poor migrants' need for it, and want, our insatiable desire for food, goods, and services at ever cheaper prices. These three dynamics resulted in over 100 million unexpected migrants. The result is a structurally embedded global migrant working class. The world economy and the world are awash in migrants, documented and undocumented, driven by war, drawn by work, and destined to satisfy our insatiable consumer wants. Thank you. As promised, As promised. <clears throat> intellectually fearless, um, trenchant, um, and, and really tackling difficult, difficult questions. We're lucky today to have um, commentary from a couple of friends and colleagues of, of Randall. Um, people that uh, don't shy away from confronting them where that's called for, um, which helps to what, as Clifford Geard said, refine the precision with which we vex each other. Um, so I want to invite, uh, should we start with, we, we, we should have figured this out, but I suppose we could do it right now on the spot. Let me introduce Professor La Murad from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University and herself an expert on migration and particularly um, in, uh, migration uh, from the Syrian refugee crisis has a terrific book on its way to being published. We look forward to that. And welcome back to U of T, Lama. Yes? OK, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Ed. And, and thank you so much, Randall, for giving me the opportunity to be back here and, and to read this book again and to read it in a new iteration. I want to first congratulate you. I'm going to time myself also. Um, or else, or Ed maybe will give me if I'm, if I'm running late. Um, I want to congratulate you for such, honestly, such a fantastic book. I, I, you know, I felt that way at the manuscript workshop. And then reading it again was such a, it, it's, we were talking about this earlier, but it's, it's a gift to be able to write like you and to make it so, I feel like I'm hearing you, to make it so, um, in some ways very uh, pleasant to read through very, very difficult things. So, so that's, I think, a, a wonderful gift and, and thank you for giving us the opportunity. And what I think, I'll start by giving a very broad um, uh, thought around the framework of the book as a whole and the strengths that I find uh, in it. The first is that, to me, it's, it's one of these uh, exemplar uh, books of bringing together large structural transformations in the global system as you do and as you've done in this presentation, while also in the book really accounting for the nuances of how this plays out at both national scales and regional scales. And you have a, a particular, I think this is your, 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 the historian uh, tendency in you to, to really also focus on contingency at the same time that you're focusing on these broad, you know, very, very systemic changes. And you, you speak a lot in the book of, of a specific leadership and, and how particular decision making for is, it becomes very critical uh, in, in, in these moments. And that's true of Sadat as it is of Merkel. You, know, you talk about these, these importance of leadership, I think, in really profound ways, while also not um, discounting the importance of structure. So my main comments, though, will center around what I think are the two key contributions of the book that are particularly resonant in my subfields. 
that is both um, refugee studies particularly and Middle East uh, politics. So the first thing is that I think the book hits at a, at a really critical and important moment in migration refugee studies where there's been a lot of ink spilled and I think there will be a lot more conversations to be had on the limits of the refugee migrant binary. And for those who are not you know, in that jargon, this is otherwise known as the difference between forced migration and voluntary migration. And there's, you know, this has been a really burgeoning conversation, refugee studies and migration studies over the last five years especially. Uh, there's books coming out on that um, you know, all of the time, special issues. But much of this discussion has really centered on the issue of categorization. And namely how the, the particularly limited definition of the refugee within the 1951 convention privileges those who, are, who flee their homes due to certain types of drivers, namely political violence and persecution, over others who are driven to do similar things due to other factors such as hunger, economic deprivation, and criminal violence, among other things. And relatedly, much of this literature focuses on how that blurring or that difficulty to, of, of distinguishing normatively uh, how these different drivers um, are, are distinct, that this is a, a legal category that we shouldn't uphold or that we should challenge, right? So it's really driven from this blurring of those two categories. And this literature, in brief, I think, often focuses on how so-called migrants or, or workers or migrant laborers are actually a lot more like refugees than we think, and that perhaps our legal categories should reflect that. However, what I think you do and what this book does is different, and I think it contributes significantly to that discussion. What you show, among other things, is that actually refugees are actually living lives that are actually a lot more like migrants and migrant workers than we often truly care to admit. In this case, it's not categorization per se or the legal statuses, because as you said, some of these people are recognized as refugees in many of the places, um, but really about the enduring desire to keep migrants and refugees out of the global north, except when and to the extent to which they can be useful for maintaining our existing economic system, and more specifically, as you say, keep our goods cheap and our cost of living tolerably low. So the vast majority of refugees worldwide do not have and have very little prospect of obtaining what UNHCR and forced migration scholars often talk of durable solutions. That is, they're unlikely to get resettled and become citizens of a third country, like Canada, for example. They're also very unlikely to be fully locally integrated in the places that they're hosted. That is, they're unlikely to get full legal rights and citizenship in these places. And they're also, due to the enduring nature of civil war and conflict, unlikely to be able to return safely to their homes. So refugees, in many ways, become stuck. And they become stuck, as you also mentioned in the book, mostly in the global south, in places that you know, end up integrating them much more as workers than as <coughs> refugees in their own right that have legal rights that come with that category. And as such, they become embedded in and integral to our global economy because they get in integrated into these, um, into these systems. So this is the case, for instance, of the, the cases that Randall opens the book with, the Syrian refugee who forms a part of a key labor force in Turkey's textile industry, legally in, in Syria, uh, sorry, legally in Turkey, but not likely to, to have the full uh, legal rights that often are assumed to come with refugee status. And it's also true of the Karen refugee who finds himself without status working in Thailand, for example. Similarly, migrants that leave their homes for the chance to improve their lives as migrant workers, may also then find themselves trapped in these places and then have to flee for reasons that have to do with war. And this is where the kind of interconnectedness is so important. This is the case, for instance, in, in the cases that you talk about in the book, of Nigerian migrant workers who find themselves in Libya, not because of conflict in Nigeria, but because they want better lives in Libya and they're working as migrant workers, but then find themselves in Libya as civil war breaks out and are, can't, and, and are trapped in that, con in that context and trying to find their ways uh, to Europe. And there they work alongside civilians from Sierra Leone who fled civil war there and have been integrated into the labor market in, in Libya. So 
So I think this key concept that you have in the book of the refugee labor nexus is, is really going to open up new areas of research and discussion on the other side of that refugee migrant binary that we often don't get to talk about a lot. And this book, I think, advances this so well, in part because it's really focused on the empirical and historical uh, um, drivers of this, rather than simply the theoretical debates, which I think much of this literature is very animated by, and the questions around legal categories. The second major contribution that I see is on the, the broader discussions in Middle East politics and, and, and in other areas as well, on the relationship of oil to political governance. And this has been a question that's really central in Middle Eastern studies for decades. And it often focuses on the way in which oil shapes the political economies of states in primarily, though not exclusively, the Gulf. And how ultimately oil might limit pressures for democratic governance. This is what often is referred to as rentier state theory. And in this literature, but also in our sort of common understanding, when we talk about political systems that are dependent on oil, it's often this dynamic that we're thinking about. One of the aspects of this book that I really, really, really love is that it pushes us to think, sorry, <laughs> peas are very, uh, that it pushes us to think of the ways in which our own political systems in the global north and the balance of power within them may also itself be dependent on oil, just not our oil. And in some ways, as you alluded to in your earlier comments, it's not a stretch to imagine the ways in which our own democracies would have become frayed if we faced with extreme oil scarcity or the rising cost of oil if there wasn't an outlet, which is cheap migrant labor, to balance that out. So what it does, I think, really, really well is recast the dependence of political systems on oil in a much more global and interconnected sense, right? It's not only about Gulf states and their own, uh, you know, uh, particular um, dependencies. So in this way, I find this a, a, a very surprising but really great rejoinder to the work of, of Middle East scholar Timothy Mitchell. And, and what, I, what I think is particularly powerful here is that you're really able to integrate how the process of oil dependence is not just also about geopolitics, but also about consumer demand and our own embedded social structures here. So Timothy Mitchell talks about how the shift away from coal to oil weakened the power of organized labor in the West, in part because of the structural properties of oil extraction and the ways in which labor was organized around it, and the fact that most of it was not in the West, but in the Middle East. I think this is a very complementary argument to the one that you bring forward. Interestingly, and this is something I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on, one of the things that uh, Mitchell talks about is how the ability of coal miners to shut down and, and, and really break the source of energy gave them enormous power in pushing for democratic claims in the West. And it's interesting to think of, of, of the parallel here of how the shift away from workers being able to actually control the flow of energy to when states do it in the form of OPEC, what, how that effect is different and how that changes the relationship of oil to political systems. Related to this, in the book, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're very careful to not say that foreign policy of the United States in particular is driven entirely by oil. And I think you, you also make that very clear in, in the presentation. You go to great lengths to show how other factors are also important. But you do emphasize right, that without oil, many of these uh, wars um, in the Middle East would not have likely to happen. What you show is that oil actually creates strong in incentives for the West to try to control it, right, and to control the access to it. And in this, this in turn has devastating effects and ends up driving more displacement. Here, I think there's actually a parallel between the dependence on oil and also the desire to control borders. As we think about the ways in which and this is something you also talk about extensively in the book, the EU's desire to control irregular migration ends up driving EU states to give money, ultimately billions, and even weapons, to regimes that ultimately use them to strengthen their own coercive apparatus and repression, both against migrants, as you talk about, but also against their own citizens. 
and that this ultimately then also feeds more displacement, right? So the desire to then to control borders ends up also being something that drives uh, displacement. That's, I think, a part of the war work want that's not as explicit. And I think there's, there's, it's, there's a, again, this connects with very recent work that's, that's starting to come up on the effect of migration management aid, as it's commonly known, uh, on authoritarianism and the repressive apparatus of the state. So I think it's, it's interesting to think about how that desire to control borders is also feeding further um, repression and, and deteriorating conditions in these countries. And finally, I'll end on a, on a note that I, I feel like Randall may or may not want me to be pushing him on, because I don't know if he, um, which is a slightly normative question that I saw at different points throughout the book, and I, you hear it a little bit in your presentation as well, and I'd love to hear you uh, sort of talk about more explicitly. And that's the question, ultimately, of responsibility. And whether and how the responsibility of certain states, and, and you go at the United States in particular, but also uh, uh, Europe, and even perhaps their societies at large, right? Us as citizens, consumers that are buying these goods, our responsibility in producing the conditions that lead to displacement should also then affect and impact whether we have duties to address the harms that come from that. So for instance, in discussing Merkel's quite remarkable response to the so-called European refugee crisis, you say, you know, and, and, and her willingness to take in nearly one million Syrians, uh, Randall says, contrast that with the US's negligible figures in terms of resettlement in that same period, and here I'm quoting, Randall says, the country that did so much to generate Middle East refugees, Middle Eastern refugees, did so, little, did so little to help them, leaving the responsibility to Germany, the country that opposed the 2003 Iraqi and 2011 Libyan adventures. You don't go on to say whether that's, you know, whether there's a normative problem there and whether that's something that we need to be addressed, but, but I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on that. And thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Lama. Um, terrific. Um, finally, we have Professor Phil Triadophilopoulos, um, who is Professor of Political Science here at U of T, UTSC, and, and also um, a, an old friend with a, with a very nice jacket, very similar to mine, so I must compliment you on that. Um, he's also the acting director of the Harney Program for uh, on ethnic, what is it? Ethnic Immigration and Pluralism Studies. Did I get that right? I think that's right. Ethnic immigration and pluralism. Okay, yeah. all right, pretty pretty close. Um, and and Phil is uh, like Lama, also an expert on questions of migration and immigration. Over to you, Phil. Thanks so much, Ed. And uh, you know, I'm genuinely uh, delighted to join everyone here in celebrating the launch of Randall's book. Um, Randall's an esteemed colleague and I'm happy to say a very dear friend, and I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to discuss his work with everyone here. As our time is short, uh, I'll limit myself to three points. First, some words about the book, highlighting what I find especially appealing. And I will read from the book, which I hope encourages you to buy a copy because the boxes have been unpacked and they're outside. Second, uh, a little bit about what I believe, building on, on Lama's comments, what I believe it contributes to migration studies, but not only to migration studies, to social science more generally. And finally, um, not so much criticism, but some questions that the book provoked. Uh, namely, why not say more about the Cold War and its demise as drivers of mass migration? Second, what about the rise of a global middle class and the related movement of highly skilled immigrants? And thirdly, what of demography, specifically the shrinking of working age populations in the global north and the sorts of demands that creates for immigration? First, to begin, I love this book. Um, I had high expectations because Randall's work is always excellent but those expectations were surpassed. It has, as you now know, a powerful 
pointed argument that takes no prisoners whatsoever. Randall is never one to dilly-dally, and his forthrightness is on full display here. I'm paraphrasing his half-hour comment like so. Quote, me being you, trying to get the point across. Do you want to understand global migration and much else since the mid-1970s? Here's me. Then you must understand the revolutionary importance of the 1973 OPEC oil crisis, the inflationary uh, crisis that it provoked, the economic malaise that followed in the industrialized democracies, and the huge transfer of wealth it enabled, which in turn transformed the Middle East and, by extension, the world. Wow. That is macro stuff, yeah? And I love macro stuff. But you have to be able to pull it off, and Randall pulls it off. Whereas uh, political scientists' explanations of the paradigmatic shift from Keynesian to neoliberal macroeconomic policies in the late 70s and 80s often refer to the 1973 oil shock in passing, you know, it's sort of mentioned and then we move on, Randall provides a detailed, painstaking reconstruction, often gripping a discussion that really drives home its importance. And in so doing, he provides us with a beautiful example of what the sociologist William Sewell dubbed eventful sociology, which I understand to be a historically informed understanding of how signal events shape social and political processes. The book, as Lama mentioned, is also beautifully written. Randall is not afraid to put himself into the book, something that social scientists almost never do. And he draws wonderfully from his personal experiences to amplify his arguments. These vignettes are among my favorite parts of the book. Here's how Randall begins chapter 22, What We Wear, page 260 and 261. In the summer of 1985, I'd had enough. The previous two years at school, grade nines and 10, had been hell. The school was rough. Why a school where 40% was taken up by shop classes was not a red flag to my parents remains a mystery to me. I was a year younger than my classmates, and I was on the small side. I was poor, which was by far the worst obstacle. My clothes were cheap, and they looked it. I spent most of the ninth grade being bullied, and most of the tenth hiding. Over that summer, saving money, I earned as a dishwasher at a fast food chain in Yellowknife, I decided to transform my wardrobe. When I got back to my hometown, Penticton in British Columbia, I headed to the Hudson's Bay, the Canadian equivalent of Sears with a history of colonialism and dispossession to match. I spent almost my entire savings, close to $1,000, on one shopping trip. As the cashier ran through the mountain of clothes, a friend who had accompanied me quietly sang Madonna's Material Girl. Among the items I purchased were sweaters for the coming winter. I gravitated toward mid-range offerings, and I recall the price to this day, $50 each, which rings true. Um, $50 each. 35 years later, looking at the Bay's online catalog, uh, catalog, sweaters in that range vary from $45 to $60 each. The minimum wage in 1985 was a fifth of what it is now, and those sweaters have fallen in price by 50% in real terms. Um, 35 years later, I'll skip over a bit, thanks to the fall in apparel prices, I have a better life than a professor earning my salary had in 1985. I very much hope that some of my former classmates have a worse life, but that's another matter. <laughs> I do not hesitate to pop into Marshalls and buy cheap quote-unquote designer shirts if I have an important meeting or a good evening planned. My better life and the better lives of hundreds of millions like me wearing affordable and hopefully stylish clothes depend squarely on others having a much worse life. That's, that's gold. That's brilliant. Randall doesn't suffer foolishness and his ordinary side is in full force in the book. His careful dismantling of arguments made by Sir Paul Collier 
and Alexander Betts uh, concerning Angela Merkel's decision to not close Germany's borders to Syrian refugees in the fall of 2015 is especially nice. And that is on page 136 to 137. <laughs> I wish I could read all of it. But, uh, you know what I'm talking yeah. about, right? <laughs> <laughs> A pair of white male academics argued that she had placed, uh, Angela Merkel had placed her heart before her head, and in so doing gave the green light to murderous smugglers. It's hard to imagine a more gendered analysis. They might as well have accused her of being hysterical. In continental Europe, politicians on the right and above all on the far right held Merkel directly responsible for the refugee crisis. All these claims are false. Randall goes on to point out how the German decision, quote, itself violated nothing in the Dublin Convention, which provides an entitlement, not an obligation, to signatory states to ask first country of countries of first asylum to process claims. The decision to suspend complex, lengthy, and expensive refugee adjudication regimes and to process asylum seekers passing through other EU countries reflected not emotional weakness, but rather two rational calculations. First, almost all Syrian asylum seekers received refugee status in Germany, so formal asylum procedures were a waste of time and money. Secondly, hundreds of thousands of refugees were trapped in Hungary, unable to return, while Viktor Orban of Hungary refused to recognize them as refugees and threatened to imprison them. When, as inevitably would occur, tens if not hundreds of thousands arrived at the Austrian border on foot, Vienna would face the choice between letting them in or unleashing clubs and water cannons on women, children, elderly people, and yes, young men, in the full view of cameras. He goes on to point out that this was the crux of the decision. Merkel, cautious to the last, not a hysterical, emotional person, Merkel, cautious to the last, made the final decision after speaking directly with Austria's uh, President Feynman. Germany would open its borders with the hope, vain as it turned out, that other European countries would accept their share of refugees. The need to help Austria, a fellow EU member state and one of Germany's closest allies, roughly what Canada is to the United States, was not naive sentimentality, war guilt, or Christianity, it was the critical driver of Chancellor Merkel's decision. Again, that's in two pages, less than two pages, to go through such a complicated historical event, to destroy two colleagues who said something foolish and teach us something in that short space of time is something really special. I could go on, but I can't because I'm already going on too long. My second point was what the book contributes to migration studies and social sciences. And here I'll simply echo what uh, Randall says in the book. And he says the following, he's keen to reintroduce political economy to migration studies and to enhance the importance of migration in social scientists' understandings of massive changes that have transformed the world since the mid 1970s. And he succeeds admirably in both tasks. I'm not exaggerating or engaging in flattery when I say that War, Work and Want is an essential book for all migration scholars and all social scientists interested in understanding, first, the decline of unionism, the decline of working class wages, the decline of life prospects for working class people across the industrialized democracies. Second, the ravaging of the Middle East, the rise in religious extremism, and huge human costs borne by people in the, in the Middle East, particularly in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria because of the events set loose by the OPEC crisis. And finally, the real human costs of globalization as they're experienced by precarious workers the world over. That's a good contribution. In closing, I want to raise some questions that the book provoked. Um, and Randall, you can do what you want with them. First, why not more on the Cold War and its demise as drivers of mass migration? Here I'm thinking about the proxy wars in Central America in the 1980s which produced massive waves of forced migration in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and elsewhere. The flow of Indo-Chinese refugees after the American defeat in Vietnam, 
the collapse of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, the rise of successor states, and subsequent wars which created tens of millions of forced migrants as well. The end of the Cold War, as you know better than I, also led to the weakening in some instances, uh, the collapse of client states, especially in parts of Africa. And this too generated huge movements of forced migrants in the mid to late 1990s. Second, what of the rise of a global middle class, another consequence of neoliberal globalization? What of the rise of a global middle class and the related movement of highly skilled immigrants? In the United States, immigrants make up a relatively large share of well-paid and higher level positions. 28% of physicians and surgeons are immigrants in the United States. In Youngstown, Ohio, a city ravaged by globalization, immigrants account for three quarters of physicians and surgeons. Most of them come from East and Southeast Asia. Nurses, especially from the Philippines, are indispensable in the health systems of the US, Canada, the UK, and many other industrialized democracies. And immigrants make up a disproportionate share of entrepreneurs especially in IT. The list is long. Google's Sergey Brin, an immigrant from Russia. Yahoo's co-founder, Jerry Yang, born in Taiwan and moved to California when he was 10. Steve Jobs, raised by the daughter of an Armenian immigrant, and uh, his birth father was uh, a person born and raised in Syria, went to school in Lebanon, and emigrated to the United States. You could add Elon Musk. You could add Jeff Bezos. Lower down the occupational ladder, immigrants have helped spur the rise of new industries, including nail salons and grocery chains. Countries formerly committed to a zero immigration policy, such as Great Britain and Germany, have come to embrace policies targeting the admission of well-educated, highly skilled immigrants and entrepreneurs. Why not say more about this in a book on global mass migration? And finally, I was struck by how little was said about demographic change, especially the shrinking of working age populations in the industrialized democracies. Is this not also a driver of mass migration and one that experts, in fact, did foresee quite early on uh, and one that continues to shape flows today? But enough of that. In closing, I think, and this is my standard, the measure of all excellent books is their ability to inspire thinking. That's the true mark of a classic. Randall has succeeded in writing a book that inspires us to think, to raise questions, to smile, and too often uh, to come close to tears. War, work, and want is learned, theoretically intrepid, and above all, deeply humane. I encourage everyone to read and learn from it. Thanks. <clears throat> terrific. Do you, do you want to go ahead and uh, we can do collect a few? We can collect a few. Yeah, okay, so terrific. Honest. All right. Um, there is an online audience. Um, folks who are online, please feel free to drop a question. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen with any luck. Um, those who are with us in person, there's a microphone that's going to be made available very shortly. So just raise your hand and um, there's somebody over there. And what, we'll collect uh, two or three or something like that. At the beginning. Yes, th thank you. Thank you, Randall. Thank you both uh, discussants for an excellent presentation and comments. My name is Anna Trendafolido. I'm the Canada Excellence Researcher in Migration and Integration at Toronto Metropolitan University. Randall, I really liked, um, I mean, I haven't read the book, but I look forward to reading it. Uh, and I really like what you emphasize, the disconnect between global value chains and international migration that we all forget. I like very much your emphasis on how socialism failed in the Arab world and in Africa, um, and also how really, you know, we have global migrants being essential to global capitalism. But I have two questions. One is, why do you consider migration as abnormal? Um, I think migration, people moving, is normal. And actually, there's not many of us moving. Actually, the fact that 2.6% went to 3.5% still makes migrants a tiny minority. And if we think about the political value or the political attention given to, to migrants, that's, for me, a paradox. And I would say it's the national state that is abnormal, not migration. 
And the second thing related to that uh, that I think Lama uh, mentioned is control, how migration control generates a lot of the dynamics. And the second uh, question that where I would, I think also Phil prompted you a little bit on that, but I would like to hear a bit more, is the broader context of socioeconomic and technological transformation that really, um, how can I say, uh, puts in a frame of wh what you're arguing w with a very important polit critical political economic perspective. And this is what I call the Zara model. So how technology enables both the offshoring and you know, migration. And what I also call the Googleization of the world, where actually relative deprivation has gone to new heights in the last 20 to 30 years, precisely because we all know what is happening and we all see images and actually even we are going into an oral culture anymore, right? And it's, no, it's, no, it's only you know, the, you know, the advantage of us researchers, everyone else is on an audiovisual um, you know, register. Thank you. There's a, uh, let's do one more question. I see a hand in the back there. Hi, Randall. Um, really looking forward to reading the book. We've talked about it quite a bit. So two questions. Um, so you, you, you point out that most countries, public opinion is opposed to immigration, but then you don't really continue with a public opinion story. And so one crude way to fr fr uh, sort of frame what you're saying is we like cheap stuff more than we hate immigrants. Right? Is that that's sort of the? I mean, there there are other explanations, possibly about sort of the salience or the distributional costs. But maybe you can talk more about why sort of economic interests win out over sort of public opinion or attitudes. And then the second is there's another development happening during this period, which is sort of trade liberalization, globalization, which also affects the incentives of firms. Now firms can offshore production. They're uh, competing with low-skill imports, so a lot of these low-skill firms based in the US or North America are closing down, and so they're not lobbying for increased uh, immigration liberalization. Instead, it's cheaper for them to actually just move their uh, production overseas. So, so are they still, is it still these economic interests which are pushing for uh, trade immigration liberalization once you get into the 80s and 90s? Thanks. I think your plate is full. Okay. Go for it. Um, no, we like cheap stuff and we hate immigrants is more what it is, which is to say publics remain opposed to immigration. We see the far right on the rise everywhere. Uh, refugees, I flashed. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll say that again um, in case the uh, online audience didn't hear it. Uh, we like cheap stuff and we hate immigrants. Um, public opinion is resolutely opposed, except in this country for reasons we could go into. Uh, the far right is on the march. Uh, <coughs> I showed a slide in the middle of bodies. Those are refugees that drowned in the Mediterranean. We block them in boats. We send them back uh, to Libyan torture camps to countries where their feet are cut off. And then when they make it through all that, they deliver our food and work in our sex shops and clean our floors as undocumented labor. So we, we degrade work, we de-skill work, um, and we hold them in contempt for what we force them to do. I think that's much more of the situation. I do talk about trade liberalization in the book, and that's why I spoke in these specific sectors. There was, there was automation and there's offshoring, but there's certain things that you can't automate because they're labor intensive, and there's things you can't offshore, it's more complicated. And that's why I looked at agriculture, meat packing, uh, uh, textiles. Um, and so anything that couldn't be offshored or automated, that's a huge element of the story. Uh, t uh, technology is a massive part of it. That's where labor was. Uh, wages were, were debased. Um, Anna, I must have given the wrong impression. I don't, I don't view immigration as abnormal at all. I'm personally rather supportive. It was a social science puzzle that looking at the evidence, you would have expected immigration to decline and it increased in public supposed. I mean, it's what we do in political science. We discover puzzles that no one else thinks are puzzles and, and we solve them. It's what gets us up in the morning. <laughs> Uh, so that was a purely social scientific, uh, and, and this kind of bleeds into the 
an underlining normative point is that we absolutely have to recognize, not merely in the global north, also in Asia, in the Middle East, everywhere, our structural dependence on cheap migrant labor, and we need to open channels for it. So quite the opposite. I think not only is immigration um, normal, it's an essential part of, of global economic processes. We can't stop it if we want to, and when we try to stop it, we just generate more human, more human misery. Um, and the states are definitely part of that. Yeah, um, let me go on to uh, the really excellent comments. Thank you, both brilliant. Uh, on uh, the normative, yeah, I, maybe I, I pulled my, my punches a bit, uh, but there is no question um, <clears throat> that above all the United States, but also France and Britain in the case of Libya, made s disastrous decisions, launched wars, and both responsibility to protect that crew and the neocons, they're both equally guilty, that got hundreds of thousands of people killed, that destroyed structures without thinking of what would come in their place and didn't give a second's thought to the most vulnerable people uh, in those conflicts, Syrian themselves, Afghan themselves. But in the case of Libya, search for the do documents, you'll see not one mention of the 2.5 million migrants that were working in Libya in 2011 because of the oil industry, because Libya is a major oil exporter and they are the ones that are now in the torture camps. Um, Yeah, Phil, great comments as ever. You always go right to the, the heart of the matters. I will feebly try to defend myself. Um, on, on the issue of, of Africa, you're right for a global book that is an oversight. Um, my, next, my, my current book project, which is looking at migrant and particularly refugee flows to Europe alone, wants to uh, take a similar approach to precisely that issue. So that, all I can say is I'm moving on to that. Uh, next, <clears throat> demography, <clears throat> I, I don't give it that much attention, uh, but I absolutely agree. It just exacerbates, and we're seeing that now, our need for labor and the sort of labor I look at, low-skilled labor as a population ages, you need more caregivers, uh, more nurses. I was doing some inter interviews in Italy, and uh, we have a highly aging population, basically everyone Every Italian family, or most Italian, vast majority of Italian families have someone 75, 80, 90, and they're being cared for by particularly often Ukrainian, Central European, East European, rather than African uh, caregivers, often undocumented. So that's only going to exacerbate, accelerate these processes. Um, the Cold War. So the link is with the the proxy wars, yeah, so certainly the Cold War in an African context, proxy wars generated refugees. The end of the Cold War, the, the, the largest refugees that were generated were, of course, Yugoslavia. I don't know, I may send that back to you. Was it determinative of major, major flows? Yeah, but those aren't the major, major countries for outflows. Yeah, um, where were we? Yeah, so there were some- Central Asia, yeah. In, in those cases where the end of what was the way the world was organized for half a century led to the generation of new states, you saw the typical refugee generating pattern. And the numbers, when I went back and looked at them, were higher than I remembered, mm -hmm. um, which was surprising to me as well. So it's less a critique than an honest provocation based on reading the book. Point. Go back to that. I think partly I was reacting when when the um, uh, Berlin Wall fell. I was in in British Columbia, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's it's a talent I have, so missing everything, of course. Um, but but what people emphasized was that Western Europe was going to be flooded by all these, and indeed collapse. It was quite hysterical by all these Central Europeans. You know, the walls down were all we're all heading west. And the only country, the only place that happened to a significant degree and certainly didn't create collapse was within Germany itself. So I think perhaps I overreacted to that, those incorrect. 
predictions. Global middle class, uh, skilled immigrants, very simple answer. Everyone talks about them, everyone loves them, they're popular, everyone wants skilled immigrants. So very important, but just there's so much action there. They're uncontroversial, there's this race for skill. Like the most appalling right-wing racist will say in Europe, oh, but we, we support skilled immigrants and we want Canada's point system. I mean, it's almost, a, it's almost a trope. So I just felt like that deserved less attention. And you know, let's, you know, let's face it, these guys are doing fine. If you're an Indian worker at Google, you're, you're not suffering the sort of processes that I'm talking about here, though you're probably work, working too hard in another sense. Um, global middle class, though, in a different sense, that's really the focus um, on on countries that went from poor to being rich, there aren't many of them, like Thailand, like the city-states of Hong Kong, and, um, whatever Taiwan is, and um, the middle-income countries like Thailand, which you found there is exactly the same process in which this upskilling, um, increasingly rich domestic middle class generated demand for cheap labor that l made those countries. So Thailand is a massive, immigration country, and it is almost the perfect embodiment of the um, war work nexus and the, re the refugee labor nexus, given that it's surrounded by these war-torn authoritarian uh, states. And another element that we talk about, you've read about Prato and the textile firms in Prato. Mostly, most of the press says, oh, these are mostly undocumented Chinese immigrants that are being exploited to produce the clothes for Piazza Italia and other firms, fast fashion firms. Yes, but some interviews in Prato last year, the Chinese are now moving up the value chain, have managed to buy some of these firms. They've become an Italian middle class, and it's now African migrants, who undocumented migrants, who are at the bottom of that value chain. So in a sense, the emergence of a global middle class and a migrant middle class just repeats these processes. Yeah. Um, other, other questions? I see Diana from in the front. Um, let me ask a question that comes from online, although I, it sounds like maybe this doesn't figure into the book. Uh, the person asks, <clears throat> could you elaborate how, on how wars in sub-Saharan Africa play into the story of OPEC? I don't know, if, I, I can't recall if you covered that. Uh, the example given here is the African Great War in Rwanda and the DRC. Are they tied back to the oil crisis of 1973? Uh, that's from online. And then the next question, maybe Diana. Hi, Randall. I just wanted to join in on the congrats, not only on this explosive work, but also on such an entertaining book launch event. Um, I kind of feel like I'm on an intellectual talk show or something. Uh, I don't remember hearing people laugh so much as in this event. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about uh, automation and AI and how that impacts work um, in terms of the types of work that are needed now. I imagine that this has a lot more effect on um, the service sector than it does on you know people. We still need people to make our clothes. We still need people in the textile factories. But to the degree that that is changing our um, the landscape of work at home and abroad, do you see that that is going to have or is already having and will have what kind of an impact or are we gonna, is this going to basically um, kind of counter the argument that you've made, um, which I think is correct, but that we don't, maybe the West um, and the rich countries don't feel like they need in the coming decades, they're not gonna need that cheap labor, that steady supply of cheap labor. And so for the economic rationale for allowing immigration would then be undermined. Oh, I get to go. <laughs> Hi, Randall. I'm looking forward to reading the book. It sounds very interesting. Um, to continue on the discussion about how the changing nature of labor will affect migration patterns, right now I'm an engineering student, and one of the things we're learning about is how consumers are increasingly, at least claiming, to care about ethical consumerism as we're learning it in class. My question to you is, uh, well, on one hand, do you think this is genuine, that people will tolerate the ethical consumerism even if it means they lose their cheap stuff? And second, how do you think this will impact migration patterns if, this, if it is truly going to reduce the demand for cheap labor?
Yeah, so the book uh, sounds absolutely amazing, Randall. Um, so at one point you mentioned that uh, one big puzzle is why the kinds of uh, things you're trying to trace have not generated a, a political revolution. And, and then you said, uh, until populism. Well, it seems pretty clear that right populism is one of the colossal political challenges of our time. I noticed you didn't, uh, in your talk, uh, utter the word <coughs> Trumpism. I mean, you've got a, already a, a formidable list of revolutionary transformations that fall, you know, uh, from, from the, uh, what, you know, the, the whole story you're telling. Uh, well, if you added uh, Trumpism to that, you know, and then Orbanism and Brexit and, you know, all the other stuff, I mean, it would just uh, add, add hugely to what's already a huge list of, uh, of uh, things in the uh, chain of events that you're trying to trace. Congratulations, Randall. <laughs> um, I, I think it's just really refreshing also just, you know, to hear um, these macro arguments that, you know, really blend political economy also, but just with the lived experience of migrants, I think is fantastic. And so I, I look forward to, to reading the book. Um, I have a question about um, internal displacement. So how does that figure into the story? Because, you know, as I was listening to you, and I haven't read the book, right, but, you know, I had got a sense that this, this was migration across borders. Um, and if we're thinking about, I mean, things, especially in the case of agriculture, right, like the modernization of agriculture, where we see just like massive displacements of peoples, right, and peasants, um, and migration to cities, like within, you know, nation states, um, you know, what's the story there? Um, and how does it connect, uh, you know, to this mass migration, uh, global mass migration that you're tracing in the book? Um, because it seems almost that, you know, they're, they're different phenomena. <laughs> um, so just curious about your thoughts. One online about um, sub-Saharan and African, I'll just say I don't know. Um, I approach this work very inductively. It was COVID. There was kind of no other way to do it. Um, and all the stories that I read about those lines led back to OPEC. I didn't find a similar dynamic as yet in sub-Saharan Africa, but I remain ignorant, to be quite honest. So the next book project, I'll think, I'll think more about it. So I'm not saying no. I don't say no. Automation and AI. I have to say I always get quite nervous about this um, technology. You know, when I'm having trouble getting into Netflix, I text my son and McMaster, and he kind of he works me through it. So I'm really not the best person to to ask these um, questions. What I will say is predictions are quite often wrong. I've been hearing this trope about how AI was gonna destroy a demand for cheap labor for a while, and then we emerge from COVID, and what's the problem? Everyone's complaining that they can't find a contractor, or a cleaner, that there's a shortage of a massive labor shortage. So there's going to be some relationship between automation the elimination of lower skill jobs, the demographic pressures that are being increased. I would be rather surprised if uh, it'll be a long time before, well, again, this is getting into AI. It's not my, it's not my area at all, but it'll be a, a very long time between four laborers completely out of the meatpacking sector before robots can really uh, bathe and care for a 90-year-old people. Uh, they can have the sort of judgment that's necessary, but I would almost defer to the engineering student in the room because this isn't, this isn't, this isn't my area. What I will say is I think technology for the moment has accelerated this process because we want everything cheap, fast, and now. And with food, with uh, logistics in particular, Amazon, and I use it, guilty as charged, um, Amazon and Walmart are the two firms that are guiltiest in driving down wages and in creating a dependence on uh, cheap migrant labor, cheap labor in general, and particularly cheap migrant labor. Yeah. Uh, so for the moment, I think it's made the problem worse, uh, not better. Uh, ethical consumerism. Um, I mean, I'm pessimistic. I certainly try myself. And when people say to me, uh, oh, I got this t-shirt for $10, I will say, do you know how that t-shirt was made. Uh, within a student community, uh, groups like Fairware have websites where you can check the supply lines. Um, 
But there's two problems. Capitalism is consumerism. And, and again, I do those Amazon clicks. The temptation of cheap, fast, um, cheap and fast is so um, great that it's hard to overcome. And there's a bigger structural problem. In the way in which we've destroyed the working class, we have created a massive section of the labor market. 20% of the labor market in Germany, one of the richest countries in the world, is made up of cheap, of low paid labor. They can't afford anything else. So you can't say to them, oh, no, no, you, you must go to uh, Patagonia. You can't buy your clothes at uh, Zara because they don't have the money. And so you, by creating, by debasing the working class, creating more low-skilled workers, you paradoxically, it's a version of the migration control story, generate more demand for cheap products, which generates more demand for cheap migrant labor. So th th there's an element of a vicious circle. Um, in all of this. So I'm, I'm hopeful that ethical consumers will make a difference, but I'm not, I'm not massively uh, optimistic. Um, populism, yeah, I do, um, yeah, I thought I was probably getting too ambitious already. I didn't theoretically incorporate it into the overall account, but I, t I do talk about the Orangeman and, and, and Brexit, uh, and that it's, I mean, there's an element of base racism in both, let's, let's face it, but given the strength of the extent of the Brexit vote and the extent of support for Trump, you can't separate that success from the way in which uh, working class lives were decimated after the oil crisis by us, and particularly in the way in which working class men, um, and I'm the last person that regards straight white men as the greatest victim of human history, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but the way in which working class men's um, life chances were destroyed in the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, it, I think you'd be blind not to see that connection. Um, IDPs, yeah, I mean, in a sense, the, the book is about migration. I do mention in passing the fact that the vast majority of forced migrants, just look at the statistics, uh, 42 million, I think is the figure I have in my head, are, are IDPs. I mean, there's no, there's no question uh, about that. Uh, where I do talk about the dynamics that you're mentioning is the two-step process where you have internal migration in the form of rural to urban or rural to factory labor. Um, and so uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, they drew on rural labor until they ran out of it. And Vietnam's going through this process now. When they run out of it, then they turn to the migrants. Uh, the U.S., it was slightly different. What they did, uh, the firms in meatpacking and in uh, Walmart, is they took the industry to the rural labor in the South. So they used that, the greatest pro product of state socialism in U.S. history, the interstate highway system, built by the state to subsidize capitalism. And that allowed firms that were locked in cities because they were dependent on the railway system to leave union-friendly uh, New York and Chicago, where the meatpacking industry is, um, where retail slipped out of the hands of largely union-sympathetic Jewish, uh, German-Jewish owners in New York City, in Boston, in Chicago, and moved through Walmart to the Union hostile South. A massive cheap labor, but as the South got richer, you're out of that too. And that's when you found Latino migrants working extensively in the, in the meat packing industry. And the conditions were getting worse and worse because of deunionization and ever increasing demand for, for cheap meat. So line speeds ha of, at which slaught, um, uh, chickens are slaughtered have massively increased. These workers are hacking at meat as it flashes past them, cutting their fingers, cutting off their fingers, cleaning machines, they fall in and they are crushed. That is all part of this, this process. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I, I feel like that can't be the, yeah. the, the, the final comment. Um, Randall, would... 
<laughs> Mark's over here. Too. Okay, there's a whole series of other questions, yeah, yeah. but let's we do. We, uh, oh yeah, we're sl yeah, we're, let's let's collect them quickly. Okay, let's collect. Uh, this will be standing between will be the you last and a good drink round. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. And just know that the that there is a reception waiting for us. So, if you um, if you know Randall and you want to ask him um, on in the sidelines, that's also an option. So anyway, you you decide. Oh, this works here. Okay. Someone has to relieve our guilt here as consumers, let it be me. Um, aren't you putting the blame on the wrong person? And by the way, you didn't ask, really answer as uh, question. Aren't you putting the blame on the wrong people when you say it's the middle class consumer? The middle class consumer does not care if the textiles are made in Italy or in China or in Thailand or maybe in Ethiopia. The middle class consumer in Canada probably doesn't care if the tomatoes are from a greenhouse in Ontario or from, or from Mexico. It's the firms that are employing the migrant workers here who are really the driving forces who must be politically behind this, who are saying we need to have a temporary migrant worker program, right? Instead of letting the economy take its course, which would be all these jobs would disappear here, we would not have fruit picking in Ontario, we would not have a textile industry in, in, in Italy, it would be in the global south and there would be much less migration. Now, I agree this is not true for maybe meat packing. It's not true for the, 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 the Thai nurses, right? It's not true for a service that has to be delivered here, for, but for a huge industries that are artificially kept in place here and only sustained by migrant labor, the political driving forces must be the capitalists here and not the middle classes who don't care. Thank you, congrats, Randall, on the book. Um, from a policy point of view, um, what would you tell nation states or policymakers who would want to address this, meaning try to mitigate or manage the exploitation while taking into account that uh, consumer greed is just infinite and it's not going to go away? Um, is there anything you would say or, or is this inevitable? Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, um, so I suppose my question, uh, just listening to the talk, is looking forward, um, you still have a lot of states such as Thailand and uh, Vietnam and you know Malaysia, which have encouraged or uh, in the past, recent past, encouraged this sort of um, migration of uh, work into their countries, this sort of manufacturing labor at lower wage rates than we would see here, but still higher comparatively than previous mm -hmm. industries in those countries. And now you're beginning to see a lot more of that in more developing countries where there is an abundance of labor. So I can speak only to India and Bangladesh, but also I'm sure to certain countries in Africa where there is an abundance of labor and they're really promoting manufacturing or incentivizing foreign manufacturing to come into the country. Uh, I mean, is that sustainable if we're consistently watching you know, countries like Vietnam and uh, Thailand and Malaysia suffer uh, I mean, they've certainly grown and developed. I don't want to discount that. But they're also suffering to a certain extent as, these, as the labor pools are drying up. And there's an uncertain way forward. So should, should that be a uh, strategy for development for these other countries that are looking to grow in a similar way? I guess that's the question. Thanks. OK, and then I think we can take one more. Danny, did you have a question? OK, then let's do one, one, one final question and then Randall, your obligation is to end on a slightly up note. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Randall, for sharing your work. I suppose it would be a great book. I will read, read that. So my question is concerned about a transition during this period from 70s. We observed that the majority of the women, they are entering the universities. And we saw this transition, especially recently in the last two decades. So does your work also uh, trace these changes in the human development in terms of gender dimensions if the part particularly the female migrants they are if encouraged by the recipient countries are they are given the more opportunities within the origin countries to opt for the migration thank you okay great um 
thanks. Um, on, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. My handwriting's so bad, I've forgotten the first question. The second one was policy. What was, oh, firms, Mark's question, the firms. Or it's an, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question. So if we just let these sectors completely die, some of them you cannot, like construction, you cannot outsource. Caregiving, you cannot outsource because your granny lives here, she doesn't live in, in, in China. Um, Meatpacking, you can't entirely outsource, though there's complex Mexican-American uh, supply lines. So what you're sort of talking about is um, agriculture. I mean, yes, you can have a regulatory framework that reduces this sharply. It's what the Danes and the Swedes do, and I have a section in the book on the Nordic countries, and they manage to make different choices. But they have the sort of institutions, um, corporatist, neocorporatist institutions, more reasonable unions, uh, that don't exist in much of the rest of the world, including, including even Germany, and they pay tax levels that no American, Canadian, or French or German would ever would ever tolerate. It's not that the firms are innocent. I guess I'm pushing back, though, at the idea, which is a little bit popular on the left, that there's this dreadful thing called capitalism, and there's this dreadful thing called uh, firms, and this exists completely independently of my, my choices. And I, that's why I press that button a little bit, because, you know, uh, and I've been guilty of it. I used to go to H&M and, and Winners. I've, I've stopped since then. We live in a world where we think we have to buy fast fashion, everything cheap, always new, for the lowest popular price. This is generating the demand that leads to this exploitation. And frankly, regulation of it is difficult because if you simply raise minimum wages high, which is one policy response, then, if that demand is there, you risk expanding the undocumented sector. Policy, I, I get this question all the, the time. My, and I, I punt a bit simply because I didn't think of that as my role. Um, you know, when I was desperately trying to pay the mortgage, I used to do policy reports. And then at the end, I would offer my five solutions for saving the world. No one read them, I suspect, including even the people who commissioned the report and paid me my $500. I didn't see that as the point of, of this book. And so the suggestions I have that you would think about, you could think about yourself. Uh, raising the minimum wages uh, is one of them. Uh, in, in increasing the power of the National Labor Relations Board in the United States, going after firms and their anti-union techniques. So things like that. But you, you could think of them as easily as, as I could. Um, uh, development, very interesting question, and that's, I mean, I'm, I feel sensible and vulnerable in that one. Who am I to tell an Indian worker who's making not a dollar an hour, but two dollars an hour because of the movement of a textile firm, that they're exploited if they don't uh, see themselves as such? Yeah, there's a, difficult issues of positionality there. Let's face it, the, the, ret the, the West, think of the satanic mills in England. The West got rich on the back of cheap exploited migrant labor as well. Again, I'm, I, I'm more interested in analyzing dynamics than you know, telling anyone in India or China or anywhere else in the world what to do. So I think I'll respond. Uh, optimistic note. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll read the last section of the book. Um, should, should wages fall further, native workers, this is the current inflation environment, will continue to exit badly paid sectors in larger numbers and firms will have to automate, move production abroad and bring in more low skilled workers. Human trafficking and the abuse of migrants will continue and if anything increase. All the trends identified in this book will persist. Paraphrasing historian A.G.P. Taylor, the 2020s may be <coughs> when labor and migration history reached a turning point and failed to turn. Optimistic enough? <laughs> <laughs> On that <laughs> version of a celebratory note. Um, thank you so much, Randall. Congratulations on the terrific book. Thanks to, thanks to the panelists. Thanks for the great, great questions. There is a reception. You're all, uh, you're all invited. And um, once again, congratulations. My thanks, my thanks to all of you. <laughs>